Good evening, and welcome to the National Press Club. It's so great to be here in person. Um, I'm Angela Greiling Keen. I am the president of the National Press Club Journalism Institute and an editor at Politico. So I'd like to welcome all of us here this evening in person, as well as the many people who are joining us tonight at our virtual audience. I'm excited for the evening. Um, I think we're going to learn a lot, as well as support the Institute and our mission of training journalists, as well as supporting press freedom, both domestically and internationally. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Doug Harbrecht. Doug is our National Press Club Journalism Institute treasurer, as well as uh, an alum of Kiplinger's, where uh, he's got a wonderful connection with the people who have brought us here tonight. Doug. Thank you, Angela. Thank you very much. Um, I just want you to know that I haven't been dressed up like this in such an awful long time. Um, welcome to everybody uh, uh, for coming here tonight. Um, I think you're in for a really special evening, um, and you'll see you'll see that in just a moment. Um, uh, in the in this uh, documentary, which we are going to be uh, viewing shortly, um, you are going to see a fellow named Knight Kiplinger, who is identified solely as a journalist. And um, uh, yeah, he's every inch a journalist. Um, I can tell you from experience. Um, he is a, um, a dogged reporter and editor. Um, he's a very thoughtful, analytical person who uh, is amazingly putting things into context. Um, but it just, the story st just starts there. Um, uh, uh, Knight Kiplinger, along with his uh, brother Todd and father Austin, and grandfather, Willard, um, built uh, one of the most um, respected um, and um, uh, venerated um, publishing enterprises in American journalism. Um, both the Kiplinger Letter and other Kiplinger Letters uh, were launched, uh, the, uh, both the Kiplinger Letter and uh, Kiplinger's Personal Finance Magazine, which started as Changing Times, are still with us today. This is 98 years after the company was founded. How many journalism organizations can say that today? What, when will it be 100? Night, when will it be? Well, the Kiplinger Letter in 23, the company was actually founded in 1901. Well, 101. 101. <laughs> Uh, those of us who have had the privilege to work for night um, uh, know to uh, what a um, uh, what a perceptive, sharp, uh, demanding um, journalist he is, but also one of the kindest, most compassionate, and generous uh, people, and ethical, one of the most ethical people I've ever known, um, uh, and. Um, and so there really isn't anybody uh, who has worked at Kiplinger um, uh, who doesn't love Knight Kiplinger. Um, it's that way. Um, the, um, but there's another side to Knight Kiplinger, which we're going to see tonight, which is he is a history hound. Um, as, a, uh, as a younger man, uh, I love this story, as a younger man, Knight Kiplinger set off on old Route 17 going through the South, because he wanted to retrace the path of General George Washington after the Revolutionary War, when Washington visited every town and village along Route 17, um, all the way through the South, to try to get the former Southern colonies to um, uh, rallying them to, to, join, to be part of the uh, United States, the United States of America. Um, uh, when he when he dives in, he dives in head first, and you I think you're going to see that again tonight because he uh, this is an amazing remarkable story uh, that you are going to see, uh, and he has done it again um, with uh, and I think you will see too his determination, his um, his ability to um, to make history come alive again. Uh, and relevant uh, to the
the modern world and today's and the world we know today. Um, uh, before I um, uh, before night uh, comes up here, I wonder. Uh, let's there uh, at the for many years there was a Raymond Clapper Award at the um, at the White House Correspondents Association. We have some of the recipients of the Raymond Clapper Award here in the audience tonight, I, and as well out there and remotely who are watching. Would would you please stand up, uh, please now, and so we can give you a round of applause. So ladies and gentlemen, Knight Kipler. Thank you very much, Doug, for those overly kind words. It was a great pleasure to work with you as a colleague for so many years. Doug was a, a, a talented print guy who went over to the dark side and ended up leading all of our online operations, our web operations, and building them to a very successful level at Kiplinger. So he was an older dog who learned a lot of new tricks quite well. Thank you, Doug. Tonight's program is not just a nostalgia trip. Remembering a man who died at the peak of his fame, too young, as the most widely read and respected political columnist in America in his day. What we should take away from tonight are the lessons of Ray Clapper's writings, especially his warnings in the 1930s and 1940s about the fragility of democracy and free speech. When you hear people in this film the likes of the legendary Ernie Pyle, for example. Talk about the decency, the modesty, the fairness, the common sense of Ray Clapper. Don't assume for a moment that those were the norm in 1930s America in journalism and public discourse. Far from it. The rancorous, bitter public mood of the 1930s very much foreshadowed today's angry, polarized America. Among the famous columnists, most were firmly planted in one ideology or another, playing to readers who agreed with them. And they were fine men and thoughtful men, the likes of Mark Sullivan, Drew Pearson, Haywood Brune, David Lawrence, Westbrook Pegler, and that great intellectual giant, Walter Lippmann. They were variously pro-New Deal or hostile to Franklin D. Roosevelt. They were isolationist or interventionists, internationalists. But the most popular voice, literally voice in America, on American radio 15 years before television, was the populist, anti-Semitic, fascism sympathizing radio priest from Detroit, Father Charles Coughlin. He started on CBS radio, and then when it canceled him, he self-syndicated to 36 large radio stations around the United States. At his peak, the rantings of Father Coughlin had a radio audience estimated at 30 million more than one-third of the adult population of the United States listening to Father Coughlin every week. Now, Ray Clapper, the polar opposite of Father Coughlin in style, was on the radio, too. Not as large an audience, but a very substantial audience on the Mutual Radio Network. In this emotional climate of the 1930s, every bit as bitter as today's public discourse. Clapper became the most widely read columnist and popular radio commentator because he didn't play to popular prejudices. He sometimes didn't even offer a firm opinion of his own in his column. He sometimes changed his mind 
when circumstances changed, and he told his readers why. He was fiercely independent of any point of view or any party. For example, he generally admired the New Deal's goals and boldness. But he was not loath to criticize FDR for autocratic tendencies and for conducting major foreign policy conferences, for example, the planning of the United Nations, behind closed doors, locking out the press, about which Clapper complained bitterly. Clapper was passionate about free speech as fundamental to democracy, the right to voice any point of view, popular or unpopular, polite or rude, respectful or offensive, without being personally threatened or attacked by listeners who feel offended. The biggest threat to a free press and free speech in America, he felt, was not governmental news management, secrecy, and censorship, which of course he opposed, but the tendency of irate citizens to try to silence opposing points of view. He viewed this as censorship by one's fellow citizens, and self-censorship by folks who were afraid to speak up and incur the wrath of either the left or the right. In 1940, with war raging in Europe and a heated debate in this country over American aid to Britain, he wrote this, quote, when the public no longer wants free discussion, when it no longer wants to hear what the other fellow has to say and simply throws tomatoes at him, then you are working into a state of mind which points towards the end not only of a free press, but of all free institutions. Egg throwers make dictators. Clapper could be tough on government officials, but even tougher on the American public. In 1943, in the middle of World War II, he wrote, quote, democracy is based on self-discipline and ours right now is very poor. We are in danger of overindulgence, of refusing to put ourselves through the discipline necessary to survive or even to check inflation, as the strikes on the railroads and in steel show, and the fight against price controls, unquote. Tonight we are premiering a short documentary about the career of Ray Clapper, created by master documentary filmmaker Phil Wall. Let's take a look. We all know that fame is fleeting sometimes the most illustrious people in any field from a certain generation. They're barely remembered one generation later and totally forgotten two generations later. You could say that about the legacy of Ray Clapper, one of the most remarkable journalists, columnists, radio commentators of the 1930s and the World War II era. He was as beloved by his readers as he was admired and respected by his top peers in Washington journalism. My father passed away, and before he passed, he told me that there was a big box in the attic filled with clapper mementos 
and historical items. Everything was thrown in willy-nilly. There were papers, there were pictures, there were posters, there were buttons, you name it. So the first thing I pulled out was a piece of paper with the White House logo at the top. And it was White House stationery. I looked at the letter, didn't even read it, looked at the bottom signature, Eleanor Roosevelt. I knew I had come across a treasure trove. I am an only child. I am the last of the Clapper line. So basically the onus was on me to find homes for everything. I got a voicemail at my office from somebody named Gail Clapper. She didn't assume that I knew who Ray Clapper was, but I did instantly as a Washington journalist with a sense of history. And she told me that she had inherited some material relating to the career of Washington journalist Ray Clapper. And would I like to see it, especially a bronze statuette by the sculptor Max Kalish that had been commissioned by my grandfather, W.M. Kiplinger, who knew her grandfather. And I contacted her and said, of course I would like to meet you. It's unfortunate that I wasn't able to ask my grandmother all the questions that I would love to ask her today. It would have been nice to have been able to speak with her directly about who my grandfather was, and in effect, who she was. When Ray Clapper came to Washington in the teens during the Wilson administration, it was all about the printed word in the newspaper. Newspaper circulations were immense. Newspapers were available on every street corner. Ray Clapper was a great wire service reporter, UP in Chicago, UP in Washington. It was a small press corps. Everybody knew everybody else. Dear Ruth, Senator Harding talking to newspapermen in front of press tent at Harding headquarters. The most able correspondent can be seen directly facing Harding, who, at the moment the camera snapped, was trying to induce the said able correspondent to get out a pencil and notebook so he would look like a real reporter. The chin whiskers belong to the caretaker, not the newspaperman. Love, Ray. August 19th, 1920. I really didn't know about the fame of my grandfather growing up. Albeit I was young, I did understand that his career was important to our history and also important to the people of that time. His goal, I found out, was to provide knowledge to the public. He was not promoting his own agenda. He felt that with journalism came a great responsibility. I'm less concerned about the freedom of the press than I am about the freedom of the reader. Let the reader be tolerant, open-minded, interested in hearing both sides. That's the way to have a free press. You won't keep a free press with a public that only throws cantaloupes at somebody it disagrees with. Egg throwers make dictators. The syndicated political columnist was uh, a, a new subset of journalism in the 1930s. It was a, a, a small fraternity of reporters who became columnists. Some of the columnists stopped being good leg men and reporters with a lot of news value in their columns. His wife, Olive, said, I don't know how Ray does it. He's his own reporter. He was his own leg man. My grandfather wrote about the influential columnists. 
and he wrote, Ray Clapper is an influential columnist and still a good reporter. For years I have tried to analyze the qualities of heart and mind which made Ray what he was. I have given up on this because I can no more explain what made him tick than one can explain a Winston Churchill or a Beethoven. Certainly hard and incessant work. The ability to apply the seat of the pants to the seat of the chair, as Ray used to say. Perhaps his nobility came from his humble heritage. More likely, it came from the intangibles ascribable only to the infinite. Ray takes pride in his writing so that anyone can understand what he's saying. Every city, I suppose, has its mythical average character for whom the entire newspaper is theoretically written. In my Washington days, we wrote for the New York Avenue streetcar conductor. Ray Clapper, in his own mind, writes for the milkman in Omaha. From newly won airfields in southern Italy, United States bombers escorted by fighter planes attack German supply lines feeding Nazi armies around Rome. The major motivation for well-known journalists to travel in theaters of war in World War II was to see the war firsthand, to write about what it was like, to write about the danger that these young men were in every day to save democracy, to fight fascism in Europe and in Asia. I think they viewed it as their professional obligation. Certainly Ernie Pyle did, certainly Ray Clapper did. The first wave ahead of us, only about a mile. 17 ships. Jesus, these are small boys. Just doing a job. Good natured. November 5th. Our bombardier begins adjusting bomb sight. Ground speed over target is about 267 miles per hour. Still climbing hard. Coast of Italy, very clear. Raymond was covering the Pacific Front, and he didn't have to go there. It was his feeling that he needed to go there so that he could report firsthand back to the people of America on what was going on. Caught by the long Pacific swell, the boats maneuver. It's a grim show, and some of it is bombing by carrier planes dominating the sky. It was decided that he would not go on a bombing mission, but actually go up with the Navy pilots to see the effects after bombing. And they toured around the island uh, to show him. And I guess he was probably so busy taking it in and writing and writing and writing that he asked the pilot to please circle around again. The pilot did as Ray Clapper wished, and as he turned, he struck his wingman. The morning of Ray Clapper's death with was truly a national grief. His column was carried and read every morning. His voice was known to these people. He didn't seek celebrity. 
he didn't act like a star, but he was a celebrity if there was one in the National Press Corps. There were long faces on the correspondence on the morning we learned that Ray Clapper went to his death in the Pacific. There was something in him so normal, so like other people who live in houses and have families and dogs and fireplaces, that when he came to the wars, somehow it always seemed impossible that anything could ever happen to him. More than anything else, he was a crusader for the right of people to think things out for themselves and make their own decisions. People believed what he said because they could sense the honesty in his writing. Ernie Pyle, in Italy, April 1944. In 1943, a great American civic sculptor named Max Kalish, who had done a gigantic Abraham Lincoln at a park in Cleveland, he had an idea that he wanted to make statuettes, realistic bronze statuettes, about two feet tall each, of the 50 most prominent Americans of the World War II era. He had known my grandfather, W.M. Kiplinger, from their boyhoods in Ohio, in Bellefontaine, Ohio. They had known each other as, as very young men. And my grandfather said, well, I'll look around for an angel for this project. It's a great idea. But as my grandfather was beating the bushes for a sponsor for this, this project called the Living Hall of Washington, he said, well, maybe I ought to do it myself. The project consisted of Max Kalish walking into the offices of these very busy, famous people with a box of clay. And in 30 minutes or 40 minutes, in real time, sketching in clay, he modeled these likenesses, then took them back on a train to New York and finished the, the statues. Only one bronze casting was made of each of these famous figures, and they were all donated to the Smithsonian. Ray Clapper's was done posthumously. So Max Kalish contacted Olive Clapper, the grieving widow. She showed him photos of Ray Clapper. She described how he walked with great vigor, his body leaning forward, his arms pumping. Olive Clapper said that his head thrust forward as he walked, as if his legs had to catch up. He's in action, which I think is as my grandmother wished it to be and as he normally was, in action and on the go and looking for the truth. It was at the National Press Club that Ray Clapper's one memorial service was held. There was no funeral at a church, no gathering at a big funeral home. His memorial service was at the National Press Club because this was where he and his friends gathered. I'm very happy to say that I was not sad to see it go because I know that he's resting in the right place among the people who appreciate his career and what he did. Every journalist today 
needs to know and embrace the legacy of Ray Clapper, a legacy of careful reporting, of fairness, of balance, of calm presentation. It was said of Ray Clapper, he didn't tell people what to think, he gave them the information and the analysis with which they as readers and voters could make up their own minds. Now that's a great legacy we should all embrace. There are two words that I think I would use to describe Raymond Clapper. And those two words are integrity and humility. He worked by the adage, never overestimate the knowledge of the people and never underestimate their intelligence. It took me a while to understand the meaning of that message but I think when you study it, you get it. And that describes, in my mind, who he was at heart. As a journalist, I like to think that I recognize a good story when I see it, even if the good story is 80 years old. But it had to start with somebody who had the goods. And it's my great pleasure to introduce my collaborator on this project, Gail Clapper. Gail, come on up. Good evening, everybody. Catch my breath. <laughs> that was a very touching video, and it was something to see myself for the first time on video. <laughs> Whew, okay. Thank you, Knight, and good evening, everyone. Unlike my grandparents and many among tonight's audience, I am not a journalist. I'm not a columnist, a broadcaster, a public speaker, author, editor. But I'd like to believe that I have inherited at least a few of the more basic skills that my grandparents possessed. So tonight represents my first attempt as an amateur public speaker and broadcaster. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Never would I have ever imagined that a three-foot cubic box, along with a small statue of my grandfather, would lead to my standing here this evening among family and friends, addressing such a prestigious and esteemed group of professionals, selling, excuse me, celebrating my grandfather's legacy. First, a brief background regarding how my donation of the statuette to the National Press Club came to be. Through my research, I learned that the statue was part of the Living Hall of Washington, collection commissioned by W.M. Kiplinger and owned by the Smithsonian. I felt the statue needed to be placed with the collection. I contacted the Smithsonian, who directed me to the National Portrait Gallery. In the meantime, I tried to contact Knight Kiplinger. I called his offices, and I explained who I was and what I was hoping to accomplish. Within days, Knight contacted me. I was completely awestruck. His interest in my effort and his knowledge of the history of the collection and the Raymond Clapper statue was even more exciting. I couldn't believe that Mr. Kiplinger himself would visit at my home to see the statue 
and other clapper materials. He explained that the statuette I inherited was actually a rare duplicate cast given to my grandmother upon Ray's death. Knight suggested I have it and the other clapper effects appraised. It was a, they were appraised by Alan Stipek. And once again, Knight visited my home with Alan. It was Knight who suggested I consider donating the statue to the National Press Club. I was thrilled with his suggestion. It made perfect sense. I contacted both the Raymond Clapper Archive at the Library of Congress and the Olive Ewing Clapper Archive at the University of Wyoming American Heritage Center regarding donating the items. The University of Wyoming was able to archive all of the items as a complete collection. This collection, which included many of the items shown in tonight's documentary, was cataloged and adding, added to the existing archive. Raymond Clapper's library, which I also inherited, was donated to the Montgomery County Library, and Allen placed some of the autographed photographs and the memorabilia on consignment at his second story books, Washington, D.C. location. At first, I was simply thrilled to possess these valuable pieces related to our na nation's history and political figures. Going through all of the material, chronologically organizing and separating the items by category became my new full-time job. It took two and a half years to complete. As I went through this process, I realized the more meaningful value of these items. When chronologically organized, they provided me with a window into my grandparents' lives and their personal stories associated with news and politics. They also served as tangible connections to my family. They affirmed, documented, and offered insight to things that I recalled from my childhood. My family owned the painting which was shown in tonight's documentary of Ray working at a typewriter inside the belly of a military aircraft which hung over a sofa in our den. I had been told that this was a photo of him as he flew over the hump while covering the war. To my surprise, I found the same photo among the clapper effects and learned that this photo was used in an advertisement to promote transatlantic flight and included Ray's accolades regarding the speed and comfort of this new type of flight. I remember learning that Ray was there during, during the bombing of, of Rome. I came across military grid maps of Rome and a small notebook containing Ray's scribbled notes written as, as he actually flew with the bombardiers. One note stood out to me. It read, quote, try not to bomb Vatican. <laughs> There was a news article included in the documentary which announced Ray's and Olive's trip via ocean liner to European countries just before the war. I found a luggage tag and a sweet bon voyage message which my great aunt Ruth gifted to them the day they left. I knew of my ancestral roots and I came across several stories and previous family research. As a result of the information that was left to me, I was able to trace my ancestry back to my six times great-grandfather, Hermanus Klopfer, and was able to confirm what was thought to be a rumor that I am, in fact, a descendant of a Lady Peach and St. Paul. La-di-da, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I knew my grandfather died when the plane he was on crashed over the Marshall Islands while he was covering the Pacific war front. I learned the tragic details of his death based on the articles my family saved. He was flying on the US, with the USS Bunker Hill. He was flying with their ace pilot to see and take notes on the recent bombing of Inuitok. After the first pass, he informed the pilot that he would like to take a second look. The pilot responded to his request and then crashed into his wingman. <clears throat> Both planes exploded and fell into the ocean with no survivors. I came across a photo sent to my grandmother of the entire crew of the USS Bunker Hill standing at attention on the deck of the ship at sea after that mission 
in tribute and memorial to their six fallen comrades and Raymond Clapper. I never knew that the servicemen on duty in the Marshall Islands constructed the Raymond Clapper Memorial Theater. I found a photo of it with its name on the marquee above an open air stage with rows of wooden benches surrounding it. Perhaps the most touching item I found was the scrapbook my grandmother kept, which contained all of the articles on Ray's death sent from newspapers and editors across the nation. She also saved all of the letters she received at that time, and I was able to truly appreciate the shock and the sadness his death created and the sincere sympathy that she received. <clears throat> The letters she received were from very famous people and high-ranking government and military officials, such as President Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, Viscount Halifax, Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander, Cordell Hull, Secretary of State, LaGuardia, Mayor of New York, Ralph Bard, Secretary of the Navy, C.W. Nimitz, Admiral of the Navy, H.H. H. Arnold, Army General, General MacArthur and his staff. News figures, Roy Howard, G.B. Parker, Matt Meyer, Carlisle Bergeron, Lyle Wilson, and George Carlin. The letter she received from Carl Sandburg compared Ray's qualities to those of Abraham Lincoln. Among other items my grandmother received was a copy of the Daily Congressional Report from a session of Congress dated February 4th, 1944. Upon the news of Ray's death, the business of Congress ceased as various members eulogized Ray and spoke very highly of him on the record. They held a moment of silence. I also came across a large manila envelope from overseas addressed to my grandmother, which said, document damaged by seawater. It contained a news release regarding India which had obviously washed ashore after the plane crash and must have been among documents in Ray's possession at the time of the crash. My grandmother received a letter from the Navy stating that it had been decided that the wreckage would be left to rest in its entirety on the seafloor, undisturbed, in honor of those lost. I inherited Ray's Purple Heart Award, it was awarded posthumously, and it was engraved in memory. One of my most poignant experiences was the realization that while the newspaper headlines reported Ray's death, his column, called Between You and Me, was still being published in those same papers because he had made sure that there would always be columns to print if he was unable to meet a deadline. His column ran for several days after his death. I learned that upon Ray's death, some editors chose not to run his column out of respect. Others chose to, con to continue to run it out of respect. Growing up, I was aware of the annual Raymond Clapper Award, but not of its significance to journalists. My mother would cut out the newspaper article announcing the award winner each year, and I would take it to school for our ritual daily morning discussion of current events after we recited the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd share, I'd like to share with you an excerpt from an article that I had never seen before, written upon the, the award's inception in 1944, immediately after my grandfather's death. This article speaks to the journalist he was, the person he was, his legacy, and the importance of what he stood for. This article is titled, titled Raymond Clapper Memorial Fund and Award, and reads, the Raymond Clapper Memorial Fund was set up to fund the annual Raymond Clapper Award, which commemorates the distinguished columnist and reporter through an annual award for reporting by a Washington newspaper writer. This award commemorates the journalistic achievement of Raymond Clapper and all he did to justify a free press. Its purpose is to inspire Washington newspaper reporters to emulate the high ideals that he exemplified in his profession his honesty, his integrity, his courage, his earnest search for facts, his fair interpretation of his findings, his continual and fearless battle 
for access by reporters to sources of information, his constant and thorough research to balance and temper his judgment of passing events. It bespeaks his fine personal standards, his kindness, his thoughtfulness, his modesty, which endeared him not only to his colleagues, but to thousands whom he met and knew throughout the world in his rich experience as a reporter. These qualities also earned him the respect of millions of readers of his columns. The, te the, the tests applied in making this award shall be those by which Raymond Clapper always tested himself. It is to be bestowed upon the Washington newspaper writer whose work in the previous year most closely approximated the, the ideals of fair and painstaking reporting and good craftsmanship that were characteristic of Raymond Clapper and that contribute, as did his work, to public enlightenment and a sound democracy. I would like to personally congratulate the journalists that have received the Raymond Clapper Award. It is obviously a prestigious honor among journalists and one not to be taken lightly. To have had your work judged by your peers who determined that it most reflected the qualities and skills which, which are attributed to Raymond Clapper is something you should be very proud of. I commend you. <laughs> I remember my father telling me, much later in my life, that there was a ship named after my grandfather. He showed me a fancy World War II belt buckle that he had received at the ship's inauguration when he was 17, the same year his father had died. The belt buckle was inscribed with SS Raymond Clapper. He explained that his sister smashed the bottle of champagne on its bow and his mother gave a speech. That was the extent of my knowledge until I came across photos of the inaugural ceremony depicting exactly what my father had described. I was practically giddy when I found actual photos of the ship in dry dock just before it launched. It was huge with SS Raymond Clapper written on the side of the bow. I was fascinated by articles that had been saved by my family which told the story of the SS Raymond Clapper. Upon Ray's death, there was a contest announced. Whichever shipyard won the contest would receive the honor of building the SS Raymond Clapper. The contest was based on safety records. The shipbuilder with the best safety record over a certain period of time was St. John's River Shipbuilding Company in Jacksonville, Florida. That made the news and St. John's River built the ship. The christening ceremony took place just four months after Ray had died. I learned that it sailed under many different names and several owners for many years. It was being towed to a new owner in the 1970s and during that voyage, it sank. My research indicated, like the plane that carried Ray to his death in the Pacific, his namesake remains to this day at the bottom of the Atlantic off the North Carolina coast. Speaking of the ocean, the most heartwarming story I learned from information ha handed down to me was the ceremony associated with my grandmother's cremains. I remember attending her funeral at the National Cathedral when I was 10. I understood that she was cremated. I never thought to ask where her ashes were placed. Among the materials I inherited were photos and letters associated with her request to have her ashes spread along the shore of the island of Inuitok, where Ray lost his life. The family was not present, but a military clergyman conducted the ceremony. This was something I never knew took place. How appropriate and sweet. Seeing the photos and reading the associate letters touched me deeply. With regard to their personal stories relating to historic events, it occurred to me that Ray and Olive's lives remind me of the story of Forrest Gump. Just living their lives and doing their work seemed to always place one or both of the clappers in the right place, at the right time, with the right people, allowing them to participate unwittingly in significant events, yet they, were never necessarily, they never necessarily considered themselves to be particularly remarkable. The scoop that sent my grandfather's career into high gear occurred when he was the, was the only reporter waiting late into the night outside a hotel room in Chicago 
where after a deadlock at the convention, Republicans were deliberating who to put through as the presidential nominee in 1920. When the door opened, Ray was told Harding, a minor candidate and junior senator, was chosen. In reporting that story, Ray was credited with coining the phrase, a smoked, a smoke filled room, which refers to a secret, less than democratic, political decision making process. Seated in an audience prior to our declaration of war, the clappers witnessed Hitler addressing the German people. My grandmother asked, who was this strange, angry little man? My grandfather, who was definitely not a dancer, was invited to the White House by Eleanor Roosevelt to participate with other guests in performing the Virginia Reel. He did okay at the rehearsal, partnered with one of the female guests. But during the actual event, something went wrong and Eleanor Roosevelt became his partner. She swung, she swung him around so vigorously that his collar popped off. <laughs> the day Marian Anderson was in Washington to sing at the, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, she spent the afternoon hosted by my grandmother, who also escorted her to the Lincoln Memorial. Marion had expressed her fear and was worried she would not be able to sing. My grandmother offered her words of encouragement. Her fear subsided, and we know how that story goes. Although Ray's death was tragic, there is a silver lining. Ray's death occurred at the pinnacle of his career. He went out on top. He died doing what he loved, reporting the action firsthand for the average American. Although he never chased the limelight, he himself actually became a news item and then national headline news upon his death. His career helped to launch my grandmother's career and her legacy, and it opened the door for my father's career with CBS as a reporter and evening news broadcaster. As a youngster, I remember watching him delivering the news on TV during dinner. For me personally, tonight represents the culmination of a most significant milestone in my life. I feel that I am answering my calling, fulfilling my purpose, making a meaningful contribution to the family legacy, and ensuring the preservation of significant items for posterity. My effort has been a labor of love, which I am very proud and happy to share. I'm not done yet. I still have a tote bag full of family letters, which I can't wait to organize and read. Ray, Olive, and their children saved every letter they received from one another. I figure that project should take at least another couple years. <laughs> Tonight would not have been possible without the efforts of those who deserve our recognition. On behalf of my grandparents and the Clapper family, I would like to thank Knight Kiplinger, who took a personal interest in the Clapper history, effects, and statue. He set this journey in motion for me, guided me through the entire process, and provided all of us with the history and significance of the statue and Raymond Clapper's legacy. Knight is responsible for conceptualizing tonight's event. The Kiplinger Family Foundation, which is responsible for the beautifully designed and constructed exhibit of the statue outside of the National Press Club Journalism Institute Library and for making tonight's reception possible. Alan Stipek and his wife Kim, who appraised the Clapper effects, assisted in transporting the statue to the National Press Club, shipped items to the University of Wyoming, all of you in Clapper archive, and consigned other items. Doug Harbrecht, past president of NPC and member of NPC Journalism Institute Board of Directors, who actively participated in the planning and preparations for tonight's event, and whose breadth of knowledge, vast experience, connections, and contacts contributed to making this a very special evening. Julie Moose, executive director of the National Press Club Journalism Institute, this evening's event planner, and my National Press Club point of contact, who handled all of the administration associated with my donation, 
coordinated and facilitated our communications and meetings, helped to produce this evening's documentary, produced and tracked all of our invitations, and who was ultimately responsible for the logistics associated with bringing this event to fruition. Holly Butcher Grant of the National Press Club Journalism Institute, who compiled a list of all Raymond Clapper award winners and titles of the winning stories. Dr. Ryan Rest, historian, modern US history, manuscript division, Library of Congress, archivist for the Raymond Clapper archive, and Paul Flesher, director, and Ginny Kylander, reference services manager, and their team at the University of Wyoming American Heritage Center, all of you in Clapper Archive, who processed and cataloged the collection I donated. Bill Lambrecht, a three-time Raymond Clapper Award winner who assisted in finding and contacting other Raymond Clapper Award winners. Phil Wall and Naveen Malakarjuna, the very artistically talented document documentary producer and director of photography, who together created the Raymond Clapper legacy short shown earlier this evening. They were responsible for set design, lighting, conducting four hours of interviews, compiling and presenting the photographic and, and the archived content from multiple sources, taping, recording, and final editing for presentation. On behalf of the family, I want to express my gratitude to all of you Press Club members, news service representatives, White House correspondents, the Raymond Clapper Award recipients, our families and friends, for your interest in and support of tonight's tribute to Raymond Clapper. There is one more piece of business I need to take care of this evening. I'm donating a copy of each of the four books written by Raymond and Olive Clapper to the National to the National Press Club Journalism Institute Library. The, the books are over here on the table, and I will explain and describe each of them to you. The first book is Racketeering in Washington, published in 1933. This is the only book written by Ray. The foreword was written by Henry Ford. In this book, Ray speaks to corruption and the sneaky tactics involving politicians occurring within our government at that time. Some of those same issues are still relatable today. I don't think that would necessarily surprise my grandfather, but I do think he'd be worried about the survival of our democracy, disappointed that these issues still exist, and he would feel the need to seek and report the facts to set the record straight for the American public to develop well-informed opinions to take to the polls. The second book I'm donating is called Watching the World. It was published in 1944 upon Ray's death, and it is a compilation of Ray's columns, broadcasts, and articles from 1934 to 1944, compiled by Olive during her grief after Ray's death, and includes an introduction by Ernie Pyle, family photos, photos of Ray working, and a bio biographical sketch of his life by Olive. It is dedicated to those who set up the Raymond Clapper Memorial Association and annual award. Washington Tapestry, published in 1946, was written by Olive from her notes and Ray's diaries. It serves as a record of our nation, our nation capital's history, including their firsthand, little known, behind the scenes, political and social stories. The last book is called One Lucky Woman. It is Olive's autobiography. Published in 1961, it is dedicated to her grandchildren, making it my personal favorite. <laughs> Thank you all very much for sharing your evening with us. And in a professional broadcaster style, I will close with this has been Gail Clapper broadcasting live from the National Press Club. Good evening.
Thank you, Gil. Thank you, of course, for sharing the artifacts. We are so excited to have these books in our collection and on display um, here at the library at the National Press Club. But thank you also for sharing your story. Um, what a special story it is, and it's, it's relevant, obviously, today to all of us working in journalism, um, carrying on the legacy. So thank you. Um, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, thank you to our virtual audience as well for joining us. For those of you who are here at the National Press Club, I hope that you can take a little bit more time to see the, not only the books that are right here with us, but the rest of the memorabilia is in the library, which is around the corner. Um, we have in the collection, of course, now materials from the Clapper, Kiplinger, and Kalish families. So we are so thrilled to have those as part of the collection, and we will treasure them uh, and take excellent care of them. So thank you, everybody, for being here tonight, and uh, let's go. Let's go see the uh, the statue and everything else.